Now, one of the big events that starts the symposium after all the welcome and information, it is my great, great, great pleasure to introduce Meredith Whitaker, um, pre president of the Signal Foundation, who will come give the first keynote of the, of the day, the, today's keynote, one of two. Uh, she's been around for a while. She's been re doing research for a while. Um, I looked up her, her bio and her profile. I don't want to say too much or I don't want to speak for too long because it's like she will be giving the keynote and not me. Uh, you don't want to he me, hear me for the next hour. Um, if so, feel, feel free to invite me for another. Um, but uh, she, she was at, uh, initially at Google for 10 years and started open research there. So from 2006 to 2016, she worked at Google, which was likely one of the most fun times at, uh, at Google. And maybe she will share a bit about that. Uh, but then she felt uh, the need for doing some more research and joined the uh, NYU University uh, doing some uh, cool applied, uh, applied research there before actually ending up at Signal. Um, I assume all of you know what Signal is, but I would, <laughs> very nice. I, I assume all of you are using Signal and forcing your parents and friends to use Signals who are not in CS, right? We are, we've all fought that battle. Um, and I think Signal stands out for forcing all the other messaging platforms to become much more privacy aware and to move the needle quite a bit. With the underlying protocols, with the underlying um, just uh, ideas, aspects, and just securing it all the way, and also making sure not to store any of your data in an unnecessary way or form. Um, like one of my, my favorite pieces, apart from the, from the communication protocol, is their, their private contact discovery that they pushed a couple of years ago, uh, which for me was like a really, really cool idea that really shaped and changed the, the way how things are done. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure if Meredith is going to talk about that much, but she's going to talk about um, like looking back a bit about AI encryption and the sins of the 90s. Uh, many of you are going to be too young to remember the crypto wars, right? So that's one of the benefits of getting old, right? You remember stuff that others don't. Um, but it used to be uh, forbidden to export crypto, right? So one of the things uh, that she will hopefully talk about is uh, are these, these crypto wars and how we're hopefully not ending up in another kind of crypto war. Um, so I don't want to say much more than that and would like to give the floor to, to Meredith. Thank you. Hell yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for having me. Um, so just a little caveat, in addition to being the president of Signal, I also do all my own writing and research. So I don't really have that much time to put together really nice slides. Um, so this is not going to have slides. This is going to be me reading from a talk that represents research I've been doing over the last year, which I have not presented publicly before. And this is really research that I've developed as I'm endeavoring to better understand how we can win the fight for privacy. Like, how do we end up always being here on the brink? even though we have made the best arguments, we have won the intellectual fight in a number of cases, we continue to see threats and incursion. Um, and in this case, I think they are pretty severe. So I'm gonna take you through a kind of winding history, and at the end, I will open it up for questions. I'm happy to accept on-topic or off-topic questions, but if you have a specific plea to like, integrate your distributed protocol into Signal, you need to take that to the community forum because we're not going to litigate that here. So just a, a small warning before I get started. Um, so let's do that. Let's get started. So last week, the wonderful lawyer and privacy advocate, Rihanna Pfefferkorn, hit up our group chat on Signal, letting me know that a Nevada attorney general had file, filed a motion for a temporary restraining order against Meta aiming to prevent the company from providing end-to-end -end encrypted private messaging to minors in the state. Now yesterday, Monday, the court rejected this motion, but that is not the end of this case. And while the legal reasoning is threadbare with all the hallmarks of a weak PR op, 
It's also the most direct attack on encryption I've seen in the US since San Bernardino and the iPhone standoff in 2015, 2016. And it comes at a really bad time when the stakes are incredibly high. In early 2022, Jessica Burgess, a mother living in Nebraska, helped her daughter access reproductive health care and contend with the aftermath of this decision in the wake of the US Supreme Court's Dobbs ruling. Now, Nebraska, like many other states, responded to the court's decision by criminalizing abortion. Burgess is now serving two years in prison, thanks to Meta turning over unencrypted Facebook messages to law enforcement, which provided key evidence used to charge and convict both Jessica and her daughter. So with that, we have a small and chilling example of the serious risks that these attacks on privacy and end-to-end -end encryption pose in our current context. And also an object lesson in the real human costs of our failure to secure meaningful privacy for people. A failure that has enabled a world in which unfathomable amounts of private data reside in the hands of a handful of US-based companies, that being companies, will ultimately comply with government mandates, whether this government is benevolent or bent on criminalizing healthcare, LGBTQ rights, access to literature, or whatever else. Now, the Nevada case is just the latest in a string of pernicious anti-privacy litigation, legislation, and rhetoric that has emerged with renewed force over the last three to five years, attacking, in particular, the public deployment and use of strong end-to-end -end encryption, and working to subtend privacy and expression to the positions of second-class rights, if that. Now, these attacks threaten to effectively eliminate the ability to speak honestly and intimately, to experiment with new ideas, to blow the whistle, engage in r rigorous journalism, conduct human rights work under authoritarian regimes, access reproductive health care or e LGBTQ resources, and generally to live a full and dignified life in a world riven with surveillant digital infrastructures at a time of rising autocracy. And while these attacks are often parochial, emanating from a given jurisdiction or province and used by small-time politicians to score political points, the threat they pose is universal every time, and I don't really need to tell this room that, because of course you can't backdoor or undermine a network in one location without corrupting it in all others. This is how a law in the UK could have significant implications for, say, the opposition in exile in Belarus and others who rely on private digital communications for fundamental safety and security. Now, I and others have sometimes used the term Crypto Wars 2.0 to describe this recent spate of attacks. It's an easy analogy, but it's also inaccurate. What we're facing now is worse, in large part because of what's changed in the interim. Today, in 2024, mass surveillance of a scale and granularity unimaginable in the 1990s when the crypto wars played out has cemented itself as one of the world's most profitable business models, conducted by massive consolidated and largely US-based firms like Meta, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and others in service of targeting and influencing the billions of people who interact with their near ubiquitous services. Or put another way, the economic engine of the now mature tech industry is surveillance. Either you monetize data via surveillance advertising or you're providing services and infrastructures to those who do, look at NVIDIA and whatnot. Or yes, you are one of the few, like Signal, swimming against this fierce tide. And in a world that looks like this, bastions of real communications privacy, like Signal, are essential core infrastructure, and undermining these would leave a landscape with no place safe from centralized corporate surveillance. It's important to emphasize this. But what I'm discussing now is the strength and directionality of the tide we're swimming against, not the valiant exceptions. And sadly, the news gets worse, because this engine of mass surveillance, far from being questioned and curtailed, is currently being supercharged by the bigger is better AI gold rush which you saw in the, the paper stats, right? It's everywhere. And it's currently um, taken on kind of a quasi-theological dimensions led by these same companies. It has impelled a push for more and more and more data, aka surveillance, to train and inform corporate AI systems. 
Now, given where I'm speaking this Tuesday morning, I doubt many in the audience are hugely antagonistic to this stance, I'm, although I'm sure we can debate some of the specifics in post. In my experience, those close to these systems are often the people who recognize how and for whom they work with the most uh, clarity. Meaning that these folks, that you all, are essential in the fight to preserve and crucially extend the tools and spaces of meaningful privacy. We need you involved, we need you speaking out, and we need to work together with you to strategize to win. I've already spelled out in some brief detail how dire this moment is and how important it is that we do win. So now I want to make the case that in order to do this, to win, we cannot rinse and repeat the 1990s crypto wars playbook. We need to refuse the dated market-centric folk wisdom that is content to leave the governance of significant choices about fundamental rights, like expression and privacy, to a handful of private companies, assuming the invisible hand will work some B Corp magic. And we cannot focus on technology in a vacuum, ignoring the social, political, and historical fo forces within which it is produced and deployed. Because making these strategic mistakes in the 90s, in particular, the mistake of trusting industry and the free market while viewing the government as the sole threat to fundamental rights, is a big part of how we got here. So with that preamble, let's turn to this history, starting with a revision of the story we tell about the crypto wars. And here, I draw on the work of Dr. Sarah Myers West, Dr. Karina Ryder, and Dr. Matthew Crane, among other scholars who've spent time in these archives and come out with brilliant analyses. I'm really grateful to their work, and in addition to the fundamental research by people like Simone Brown and Seda Gersis. And when I post the video uh, of this talk on various platforms, I'm going to include links to relevant papers for those of you interested in digging deeper and learning together. And I may actually ask NDSS to post that in the description as well, so we just have it all there. So let's start at the beginning with some definitions for the young people. What are the crypto wars? Well, children, the crypto wars refers to a series of legal battles, campaigns, and policy debates that played out in the US across the 1990s. Here, questions about who should be allowed to develop and deploy strong encryption, and whether that encryption should be adulterated to enable government access were fought, litigated, and more or less resolved. In decades prior, the government had asserted an effective monopoly on encryption, so much so that the academic field of cryptography research was starved, as the NSA and others claimed the right to control and obscure work on cryptography, cryptosystems, cryptanalysis. Now, while this loosened somewhat in the 1970s, the government's desire to control the output of this research still put significant roadblocks in the way of wide dissemination and use. And moving into the 1990s, crypto systems were still classified as munitions and subject, subject to strict export controls. To integrate them into products and services and distribute them broadly, you needed government permission or you got in trouble. So this regime of secrecy and restriction ended more or less with the liberalization of strong encryption in 1999. Following that, companies and practitioners could develop and use strong encryption without being subject to these controls, and academics could freely publish their encryption implementations without fear of government reprisal if someone in Europe downloaded their package. This was a win. And it was thanks to much creative and good work by technologists and advocates, Matt Blaze, Dan Bernstein, Cindy Cohen, EFF, EPIC, and the advocacy group Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility all played a part alongside powerful tech corporations whose interests, when it came to liberalizing encry encryption, aligned with theirs. And it was an important win. But the result of this win was not privacy. Indeed, in my view, the legacy of the crypto wars was to trade privacy for encryption and to usher in an age of mass corporate surveillance. So to understand how this happens, we need to bring the process of commercializing network computation into scope, the creation and regulation of what we ended up calling the internet. Emerging from the mid-1980s and gaining speed in the early 1990s, a vision for prosperity, for U American prosperity in particular, that was focused on what would become the internet, seeded itself in US political circles, particularly among Democrats. A potted account of this history goes something like this. 
Following a sustained economic downturn related to manufacturing decline in the US, powerful members of the Democratic Party followed the neoliberal spirit of the 1980s and shifted their base from labor and the white working class to professional workers and the high tech industry. The term Atari Democrats was coined at the time to refer to those leading this charge. And they promoted a vision of economic prosperity yoked to the high tech sector. The internet somehow would replace the New Deal. It was a vision that fueled the Clinton administration's drive to privatize and commercialize network computation at exactly the time this appeared increasingly possible, given the rise in personal computing and the fact that databases and networking were becoming powerful enough to support this aspiration in reality. Now the hopes pinned on the emerging commercial internet were big. We see this in contemporaneous projections. For example, in 1998, the OECD projected, quote, a $1, trillion, a $1 trillion economic commerce market by 2005, end quote. While in the mid-1990s, Business Week estimated that, quote, electronic commerce would boost the U.S. gross domestic product by 10 to 20 billion by 20, 2002, end quote. And in 1996, the Commerce Department affirmed that, quote, the total value of electronic commerce will be close to $1.4 trillion by 2003. And remember, they're talking 1990s dollars here. These projections paint a representative picture, showing simply that there was a lot riding on the success of the commercial internet, and that much of it relied on the ability to successfully transact online. Importantly, this ambition was also global in nature. The goal was not simply to create an internet to serve people in the US, but to nurture a US tech sector that could dominate the global market, setting the terms and standards that would define the internet for everyone. And as we see everywhere around us, this largely worked. Now this drive to commercialize the internet provided a catalyst for the crypto wars. The push to commercialize forced the issue of encryption and brought it to a head. Because, of course, in order to commercialize network computation and fulfill these visions of riches and reach, confidentiality and authenticity are essential, particularly in the context of commerce and financial transactions. And, as we have it, ensuring confidentiality and authenticity in the context of network computation is quite literally the set of problems that Whit Diffie and Martin Hellman developed public key cryptography to solve something we see clearly in their germinal paper, New Directions in Cryptography, published in 1976. Or as technology writer Peter Weiner put it in 1997, quote, cryptography is a crucial technology for preserving computer privacy and making commerce possible on the internet. Without it, there would be no privacy in cyberspace, end quote. So encryption was essential for the commercial internet, but of course, law enforcement and security services saw any network resistant to government surveillance as a threat and a problem to be solved. So how to square this circle? Particularly the conundrum of achieving global technological dominance while giving US law enforcement access without losing non-US customers understandably reticent to invest in technology that provided a foreign government with a backdoor. There were many failed, even laughable attempts throughout the 1990s, and I will not spend time reviewing them in detail. From the busted clipper chip proposal that Matt Blaze popped only months after the spec was published, to the various plans for corporate-run key escrow schemes, whose naming conventions changed across the decade, but whose premise remained more or less the same, to the performance art come lawsuit that was Dan Bernstein's attempt to publish his crypto algorithm snuffle without State Department permission, which brought EFF to his defense in a historic lawsuit. All of this history is well worth visiting. It's also well documented elsewhere. So I'll leave it here and I'll focus, I'll focus this instead on the bigger picture and how we got, how all of this got us to where we are today. Because as Matthew Crane details in his excellent book, Profit Over Privacy, the process of commercializing the internet, which catalyzed and played out alongside the crypto wars, ultimately resulted in unfettered private sector surveillance. In 1996 Crane documents, the Clinton administration published their framework for the global information infrastructure, laying down the rules of the road for commercializing the internet. The framework endorsed advertising as the revenue source for internet commerce 
and put no restrictions on surveillance by private companies. And we still have no federal privacy law, remember that. It's important to understand this as the US government not only permitting, but also incentivizing mass commercial surveillance. Because, of course, the more you surveil people, the more you know about the potential customers you're advertising to, the more ably you are to classify them, make inferences about them, target them with messaging and images that will shape their opinions and behavior, or at least that's the theory. So to advertise to them, you want to know more about them, so you surveil to advertise better to them, et cetera. I should also note, as Crane lays out, that the embrace of unlimited surveillance advertising was not inevitable nor was it the only option on the table. Indeed, throughout the 1990s, the surveillance business model and its potential harms were being actively examined and debated, and many alternatives, from publicly funded network computation to subscription models, were on the table simultaneously. Nor were the privacy harms unforeseen. Technical experts, civil society groups, and even the government's own advisors and agency warned that permitting unfettered commercial surveillance could be unconstitutional and could lead to significant problems. Nonetheless, as Crane puts it, quote, the legacy of the 1990s is the concentration of surveillance capacity in corporate hands and the normalization of consumer monitoring, monitoring across all digital media platforms. So now let's bring these threads together. It was 1996 when the Clinton administration published their framework, permitting and endorsing surveillance advertising. And it was just after that, in 1999, that the US government finally liberalized strong encryption, all but eliminating export controls and making it legal to create and disseminate strong crypto systems broadly without government interference or permission. Now, 1999 is generally narrated as the end of the crypto wars and as a win for privacy. And when I was coming up in tech in the mid-2000s, it was common sense folk wisdom to view this outcome as the reasonable triumphing over the retrograde, as the moment we secured privacy and at least partially revised the musty US legal code to recognize technology for what it was, borderless, resplendent, and unsuited for regulatory restrictions. And of course, it's not that 1990 wasn't a win. I'll stress that again, at least in a narrow sense. Indeed, we can craft, craft a counterfactual in which the liberalization of encryption did not happen, in which we instead accepted some janky backdoored government standard crypto system, some sad clipper chip DES admixture, and that became the thing. Now, a world in which cr strong crypto systems did not receive the benefit of many eyes and open scrutiny would also follow. But of course, of course, the future from then to now would have been very, very different, not least of all because the metastatic growth of, growth of SSL protected commerce and RSA protected corporate databases would not have been possible. And as we see now, enabling permissionless creation and use of strong encryption was not at all sufficient when it came to ensuring meaningful privacy for people. Because the power to enable or violate privacy was left in the hands of companies, not the people who relied on their services. Companies that were incentivized, as we recall, to implement surveillance in service of advertising and commerce, and that were left to choose where and how they deployed encryption. Of course, technologies like SSL were rapidly implemented to protect commercial transactions, whereas technologies like PGP that ensured end-to-end -end messaging privacy languished outside of the standard functionality implemented by the large email providers. As Dr. Sarah Myers West puts it succinctly when she succinctly, quote, this made the internet safe for companies, but not for people. Now by conflating encryption with privacy and focusing narrowly on the tech itself, on encryption in a vacuum, while expressing concerns about privacy invasion directed solely at governments who were assumed to always be on the verge of tyranny, while ignoring and, and ignoring market actors, the legacy of the crypto wars is one of empowering the burgeoning surveillance industry to a far, far greater extent than it is of securing privacy for people. And of course, I'm not the first to lament these dynamics or to claim a loss. Among the more clear-eyed, come cynical hacker community, the sentiment that we lost the war has been asserted and debated in emotional tones since at least the mid-2000s. 
Rope Gongreep and Frank Rieger voiced this view all the way back in 2007 in a prescient talk at that year's Chaos Communications Congress, lamenting the incursion of surveillance and the centralized control of technical infrastructures post 9-11. But what we must add to the average hacker Jeremiah is an analysis of the political economy of the tech industry, alongside a skepticism of the market that matches the deep and I believe warranted distrust of government and security services, in addition to an understanding of the unevenly distributed gaze of surveillance and the racialized and gendered disciplinary regimes that surveillance works to underpin something that Simone Brown, Seda Gersis, and many others have worked to illuminate. Because lacking these analytical underpinnings, such laments often take the form of reprimand and reproach, admonitions to the technical community that assume we are each individually equally powerful actors capable of making individual choices and changes that will create a better or worse technological future. That it's our fault for using a MacBook or Gmail or having a Facebook account that it's our responsibility to use encryption, to demand metadata protection and the like. And of course, no one likes to be scolded, so these messages often land poorly. But beyond that, they're not really accurate. We don't really have this power, at least not individually, and that is the problem to solve. What we face now is largely a result of our having ceded the right to make these decisions about our technological infrastructure and their dimensions to a handful of companies. And this problem will require more than righteous individual habits to contest. So now back to our history and the aftermath of the 90s. Following 1999, an uneasy but stable compromise emerged between law enforcement and private tech companies. The outcome of the crypto wars and the emergence of the commercial surveillance internet taken together created a have your cake and eat it too scenario for law enforcement and the emerging internet industry. Companies could proceed building security and privacy into their products and services in ways that could guarantee commercial transactions, enable authentication, and create a global market. And instead of publicly requiring a backdoor and encryption, the government could quietly turn to industry for help. As Karina Ryder shows, following the 90s, government internet surveillance was effectively privatized. And in this way, both companies and government avoided an extended public confrontation over encryption and the limits of lawful access. Data created and collected by these firms could be shared with government quietly, protected from public scrutiny and outrage by the twin concealments of classification and corporate secrecy. And it's arguable that this was no coincidence, although I have no hard proof here. Reading between the lines, it makes sense that law enforcement and the security services ultimately recognized that giving up control over encryption would be okay in a context where the Clinton administration permitted private sector monitoring of online activity and where they could work with these companies to access data. Indeed, Ryder's work shows companies arguing as much throughout the crypto wars. We also have Snowden to thank for helping us align these histories and adding ballast to this hypothesis. The revelations his courage brought to light show that as if on cue, in the year 2000, just after encryption was liberalized in 99, the NSA established a program codenamed Bull Run. Bull Run was dedicated to brokering relationships with private high-tech companies to gain access to surveillance data and, where access was not forthcoming, to use other means to undermine encryption. Documents reveal that the NSA went as far as allegedly paying RSA $10 million to add a vulnerability to their core encryption software that they sold to customers, and also allegedly convinced Microsoft to add vulnerabilities to their Outlook email client, among much else. Unless we think it's just the NSA, the UK's GCHQ had a similar program, codenamed Edge Hill, which also worked to gain access to private surveillance data. Now, Thanks to the Clinton administration's decisions to place no guardrails on commercial surveillance, this data was far more extensive and comprehensive than anything the government could have dreamed of previously or could even legally collect in many cases. It was also the Snowden revelations themselves that happened in 2013 that troubled this equilibrium. Following evidence of their complicity and often illegal government mass surveillance, tech companies scrambled to regain trust post-Snowden, pointing fingers at the government while working to shore up their privacy bona fides. 
This wasn't a bad thing. It increased use of HTTPS and other privacy-preserving techniques and saw strong encryption added to the, to the iOS and Android operating systems, among other measures that enabled very important expansions of security and privacy for the people reliant on corporate tech systems. It also propelled the use of signal, the Signal messaging app and the application of the Signal protocol broadly beyond the app. But the post-Snowden privacy moment still left the power to make these decisions largely in the hands of companies whose business models continued to rely on surveillance. Now, in my view, the ferocity of the current attacks on end-to-end -to -end encryption and other privacy-preserving technologies is very much related to a desire by some in government to return to the less fettered access to surveillance that they see as having lost post-Snowden. I'll get back to this spate of attacks in a moment, but first and finally, I want to touch on how this all relates to AI and how an awareness of the role of AI in the current tech landscape ties into the strategy we must adopt if we're to fight and win meaningful privacy here and now. Because of course, AI didn't just happen. The field of AI is over 70 years old and the term itself was coined in 1956. Over the course of its existence, it has been applied to a heterogeneous mix of technical approaches that share a common aspiration, but very little else. So it's more or less an aspirational marketing term, certainly not a technical term of art. So why then has it come to dominate tech in the last decade? Again, you saw the ML paper submissions. The answer to that question is also rooted in the 1990s and in the surveillance business model. In brief, in the early 2010s, researchers showed that AI te techniques dating from the late 1980s could perform new feats when matched with significant amounts of data hmm, and significant computational resources. This is what kicked off the current AI boom. The companies at the forefront of the surveillance advertising business model, the Googles and the Metas and the like, recognized quickly that their wealth of data and their computational infrastructures gave them a significant advantage, or that what was new in AI were exactly the resources they and few others had access to. They also recognized that these AI techniques could be productively applied to refining ad targeting, news feeds, and other core elements of the surveillance advertising business model. It's no accident that all the authors of the germinal AlexNet paper that kicked off this boom were almost immediately hired by Google. Nor that Jan LeCun, whose work in the 1980s underpinned the AlexNet approach, was quickly hired by Meta. So with this in mind, the AI we're talking about today needs to be seen as an extension of the surveillance business model, or a surveillance derivative, as I've called it, as a way to expand and, and expand and entrench the profitability of the massive amounts of data and infrastructural monopolies that these large companies possess. And that due to the self-reinforcing nature of the network business models or the fact that a handful of companies are a monopoly to be less elegant about it, few others beyond these companies can really do that. In addition, the current bigger is better paradigm in which a few companies, those monopolies, the ones that possess these resources are competing to create and deploy increasingly data and compute intensive models, AI is working to exacerbate and entrench corporate mass surveillance. It needs more and more and more data. It's incentivizing and expanding creation and collection of data about people, their communities, their habits, politics, locations, faiths, kinks, health conditions, financial health, family ties and ruptures, and so much more in service of training and informing these models. And let us not forget, forget, once trained and deployed, these AI models create more data, creating another vector of mass surveillance that, while generated via inference, not, say, triangulating a, pin to a cell, ping to a cell phone tower to deduce location, nonetheless has power over us and creates information about us. So here we are. We've just taken a rapid, abbreviated tour through relevant history, which shows that we cannot view the CRISPR wars as an unequivocal win for privacy. That, in fact, this legacy is more accurately understood as helping enable mass corporate surveillance, empowering comp companies and with them governments, but not the people subject to their tech and decisions. Now, I, I want to be clear. I do not offer this in the spirit of a gotcha or a reprimand, and certainly not to argue defeat. I'm in this fight. 
And I believe that protecting end-to-end -end encryption and defending and expanding the places where it's implemented is a key plank in a critical struggle to gain ground on meaningful privacy and autonomy, a struggle that could not be much more important given the context we're living in. Which is why I'm spending time putting this history under a black light in order to see what we missed, learn from the past, and build strategies now to avoid these traps. Because we're facing some very real and very severe threats and we cannot rinse and repeat old tactics in this context. These threats currently often build on the back of justifiable concerns relating to surveillance advertising platform practices and affordances. And the movement against these is often referred to generally as the tech lash. It targets many of the practices I've already surveyed this morning or at least it appears to, calling out things like doxing, influence operations, and targeted vitriol that surveillance advertising platforms have facilitated and that have gained significant attention and ire following the 2016 election. Starting around 2018, reasonable and misguided initiatives to manage and curtail these practices began emerging, calling on governments and companies to, for example, monitor and make a distinction between real and fake content or to stop putting algorithmic weights on the newsfeed scale. These bled into a chaotic set of calls for big tech accountability. And much of this focused on children, real or imaginary, who were narrated as the victims we were saving. Now, big tech accountability in general is something I'm a big fan of. But in many cases, when you look under the hood, that is not what we're getting here. Under the banner of accountability, we're seeing proposals like the UK's Online Safety Bill, the EU's CSAM Act, Australia's e-safety industry codes, and most recently, Nevada's embarrassing but dangerous motion to restrain Meta's application of end-to-end -end encryption. These proposals share a common and deadly misstep. They leave the fundamental business models and surveillance practices of these companies untouched, or even mandate expanding it. And instead of perturbing the business model, they propose increased monitoring, gatekeeping and control of content, behavior and access, more oversight boards, more editorial rules, more precarious workers in the majority world trawling through our digital sewer, cleaning up the mess that a one-size-fits-all advertising platform has created. Now to add to this problem, this is happening at a time when weariness, wariness and frustration with arguments for privacy and free expression have gained some purchase, in a sense splitting our coalition. Exasperation at the way the US First Amendment and Section 230 have been deployed to shield these companies combines with a sense among some that arguments for privacy and speech are being wielded simply as socially acceptable pretext leveraged by those who want to maintain the status quo, not challenge it. This environment has left the army of those fighting for meaningful privacy and against the centralized corporate and government control of expression very, very thin. And this helps explain, in my view, how proposals to backdoor and even eliminate into end encryption made their way into policy and legislation that is purportedly aimed at holding big tech to account. In the name of protecting children, in the name of illuminating the crimes done in the dark. Ironically couching a move that would drastically expand the capabilities of authoritarian social control and corporate and government surveillance in benevolent terms under the ironic umbrella of accountability. Put another way, far from addressing the core problem, many of these proposals work to expand the surveillance practices of these companies to governments and NGOs at a time when our muscle to fight them is significantly atrophied. So what do we do? Well, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> but most importantly, we need to refuse the framings and the false binaries we're given. We need to reject both the tactics and narratives of the 1990s crypto wars and the current trend of surveillance wine packaged in accountability bottles. And we need to recognize the role that AI hype is playing in further entrenching the tech industry's invasion of privacy and incorporate this into our strategies for pushback. We do not want to become nannies and overseers of those same companies, leaving their concentration and surveillance practices intact and cleaning up the mess on the sides. And we cannot frame encryption as the sole goal of our fight while failing to critique and recognize the commercial business models that have made encryption, left to the discretion of a handful of companies, so ineffective at securing meaningful privacy for people. This means, in my view, that we must broaden our aperture and refocus on what we're fighting for. 
Yes, we want to end-to-end -end encryption, but we also recognize that end-to-end -end encryption is not going to deploy itself and that the business incentives in place currently do not allow for the kind of broad privacy protections I believe we desperately need. To atone for the sins of the 90s and the path that got us here, we must have the dignity to refuse the options we're being given and to demand instead not only the right to deploy end-to-end -to -end and privacy-preserving tech, but the power to make determinations about how and for whom our computational infrastructures work. This is the path to privacy and to actual tech accountability, and we should accept nothing less. Thank you. And now I will answer questions. One, two. Thank you very much for the amazing keynote, Meredith. Um, as we get started with Q&A, there's two microphones. Uh, line up on both sides, we'll alternate. Whenever you ask a question, state your name and affiliation, uh, and then we'll uh, alternate between the two. I'll abuse my privilege as a chair of starting the session to ask my first question. Um, for, for me, like an uh, amazing summary of the, the crypto wars and some of the key challenges that, are, uh, that we are facing nowadays. For me, one of the, the big issues is this change from a, like a, a public internet with open protocols, thousands of, uh, of services, servers running, open implementations, a, a plethora of like 400 different email clients, uh, all running on an open protocol moving now towards uh, a few companies running their apps with private, uh, non-disclosed, non-public protocols. Um, you brought up this, this a similar issue uh, or, or the same issue. How can we move toward, back towards a more open internet while keeping the benefits of the encryption and other benefits that you mentioned as a first question? Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Touching on that first framing, kind of the, the wild olden days of the internet when we all, you know, when it was open and, and we could just sort of spin up our own clients in our basement and maybe emails took three days to send, but, you know, it happened. Um, I'm still running my own I love, I love you for that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I think we need to be careful with sort of posing that as sort of the, the olden days we want to return to, sort of the Jeremiah framing. I think we need to recognize that at that time, someone was still paying kind of for power for the company servers. There was still sort of a, a massive kind of advertising business model that was being spun up by ad exchanges and sort of, you know, there was experimentation at that time that allowed us all to kind of play with these things. But there were actors with significant capital and significant market incentives that were figuring out how to sort of consolidate market power, not necessarily consolidate, you know, closed protocols or other things at that time. And you had, you know, Equinix and other sort of business models emerging then. So I, I think, you know, the, the answer to that question is not one I have a one weird trick for, but I think it has a lot to do with being willing to undo some of the paradigms that got built on top of these frameworks, right? That got built on top of the advertising business model and actually be willing to dismantle some of these platforms and some of these businesses not to sort of strip us of our technological you know, uh, resources and, and infrastructures, but to redistribute the power around sort of shaping those and, and how they work into different hands. Because I think you know, the, the, the issue here is that we laid down a business model that sort of incentivized this sort of you know, metastatic growth and consolidation and there are you know issues with network business models in particular with the way VC capital kind of flowed into this that you know meant effectively we were setting we were setting this sort of the the tech industry up for significant consolidation without any guardrails and a lot of that you know I think there's also a we need to um, we need to stop mystifying technology as something that can only be governed by people with um, technological expertise. I think that's something that happened, you know, over many years, and there was just a sense that, you know, you have to let progress, you know, and science take its course and not perturb that with sort of regulatory intervention or democratic deliberation. And we've seen where that ends up, and we've also seen that that's a fairly specious argument, that there are, you know, many socially significant questions that need skills other than a CS, PhD to answer. 
So that not a exactly direct answer to your question, but it's a very hard question, so forgive me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mary. This, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, my name is Bruce. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Dartmouth College. Uh, my question is, um, I'm curious of your thoughts about uh, how we should uh, address the concerns of child safety advocates who are essentially not happy with this end-to-end -end encryption for, for child safety reasons. Well, we should look very closely at the arguments they're making, demand evidence for those claims, not let the heartbreaking specter of children in distress distract us from actually analyzing the validity of the claim that end-to-end -end encryption is somehow at fault here. Because this is, we're talking about an incredibly gnarly social structural set of issues. And what I am seeing more often than not is a, a willingness to abstract those issues. The fact that the majority of abuse happens in families. The fact that we are cutting funding for actually caring for children who are abused. The fact that it's very unclear where the online reporting pipelines reports of harmed children actually connect to helping those children and holding their abusers to account. We need to stay clear-eyed and on task and demand an actual causal argument with evidence from those making those claims because I think in many cases emotionally wrenching imaginaries are being, are being invoked as a way to almost distract us from the facts at hand. And we are so willing to do anything to help children who are being abused that we will take anything they offer us and we will do it. And so I think, I think we just have to, you know, we have to remain clear-eyed and we have to remain rooted in evidence and we have to also demand that the solutions to this problem do not simply stay with the re within the realm of the computational. Fund social services. Actually help children, believe children, when they report powerful men in your community. These are things that are much harder to face than a temporary restraining order against Meta. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Hauser from Dartmouth College. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this awesome keynote and also this awesome answer you just gave. Uh, I agree so much with everything you're saying. It's very pleasant to hear somebody <laughs> talk about it publicly. Um, so my question is about uh, maybe the, the solution space here. So I really like the way you frame the problem and, and part of it is you know, the fact that there's no single entity doing this mass surveillance thing anymore because now it's, it's you know, distributed across private companies and so we don't directly see uh, the big picture, right? So there's kind of like a graph pro problem here, right? Can we compute the transitive closure of, of what's happening on those distributed nodes? And now we see that that is very alarming, but we, if we only look at each individual node individually, we, we don't necessarily see that, uh, you know, that flow of data and that, that sort of like big picture aggregation. So uh, it's clear that end-to-end -end encryption is part of the solution space, but it's also clear that it's not the only uh, solution and, and there's a big problem. The law is always lagging behind, and 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 it's not just about the law either. Like, how do we, how can we expose this problem to you know to the public and also the non-technical public so that everybody understands what's going on, and how can we frame you know what's the future of society of democracy in a world where uh, this is happening? This is very sketchy, and 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 there's no clear uh, path forward to make things better. Not to, not to sound too uh, yeah. negative, but. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, it's an uphill battle because a lot of what the public knows about tech is written by the marketing departments of these same companies, right? And kind of insisting on specificity and clarity and insisting that we, you know, actually understand these problems and these business models and the potential harms is, you know, it's a lot less flashy than invoking some sort of godhead terminator, right? Um, but I do think people are doing it. And I, I say that, I've been in tech for almost 20 years and I landed at Google like in the halcyon days. There was not a single critic in, on the campus. It was sort of, you know, true believers. The Kool-Aid was running strong. And so I have a perspective 
you know, from there that we're really, you know, we're in a, a place where, again, the tech lash is sort of, a, you know, whether or not the proposals coming out of that are misguided, opportunistic, or even sort of Trojan horses for the security services wishes, nonetheless, there is a public sentiment that is seeing a tech lash grow, that is saying something around here isn't okay. I don't like that, you know, these companies have all our data. It's creepy. It's weird. I may not have the language to wrap around my concerns, but nonetheless, this isn't you know, uh, I, I am concerned. You're saying, you know, Europe in particular is taking a stand there. So I think we need to, you know, again, clarify and add to some of that. And then also, again, you know, be willing to take drastic measures. I think it's, you know, in world historical terms, these companies are like a second old. This is a, a couple of decades this has emerged. These are not facts. These are things that were built and can be unbuilt, right? And so if we're not comfortable with meta having access to the, all this data, and beyond having access, having been, we, we've sort of ceded the authority to Meta and others to define our world for us. We've given them, to use a sort of academic phrase, epistemic authority to make calls about our world, and we treat those as if they're sort of the objective output of a sophisticated computer, not the market interests of a given company, and we can stop that, right? I think, you know, laws are lagging behind, but we can also ask, you know, some of this to slow down, right? There is no sort of natural momentum here. So I, you know, I don't have the solution, but I think you never win if you're not aiming for victory. And that's part of what I'm sort of raising here, is that if we're just fighting around the edges, we're not really engaging in a dignified battle that will ever lead to actual victory. And we need to just keep our eyes on victory and figure out like who else needs to be in the room? Who needs to teach me something I don't know about this? Who has done something in another sector you know, that matters? Because we are facing the 2024 election year. We are facing mounting climate collapse and a world in which these consolidated infrastructures in the hands of a few companies turned over to the wrong regime could have, uh, I, you know, catastrophic consequences, yeah. Thanks, I think that's a very fair answer. Uh, not to monopolize the discussion, but uh, just a, a brief follow-up. Uh, it seems that, you know, the, the current trend is to, we have this sort of trade-off between convenience and, um, and privacy, right? So things are more and more convenient and less and less private. We sort of trade convenience for privacy with all, at least the you know, most commercial products we see. And I was wondering if, there's any, if you see any way forward to break that trend or if that's something. Well, I sort of reject that, right? Like, okay. email is not convenient. <laughs> Being surveilled by facial recognition, not convenient, right? I think these have been sold as convenience technologies that often sort of yank on our sleeve and take a lot more time than I know I spent before smartphones were the norm when I was working at Google, right? So I don't, one, I, I'm not sure convenient, you know, convenience at what? Convenience at answering my email at midnight? I don't want that convenience. Thank you, though. Um, so I think, you know, what we're talking about is design decisions made by companies that are incentivized not to implement privacy. Um, and the fact that some are, I think, is showing that there is sort of pressure on them. But nonetheless, like, the business model is not that. And I think we need, you know, if you look at Signal, we, we rewrite the stack. We build our own libraries, you know, so that we are able to provide something that, you know, works and feels and looks more or less like a, you know, dominant surveillance messaging app, but at every level has as much privacy as we can build in there. So it's, it's super possible. This is not a technical challenge, right? This is an issue that there are deeply entrenched business models and market forces that have no incentive to, you know, prioritize privacy and that, we're told that it's because we need convenience, but again, I, you know, my life hasn't gotten much more convenient or better now that I have 50 frickin' apps on my phone that I have to check all the time, so. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Meredith. Robin Wilton from the Internet Society, because we can't have all the questions being asked by Dartmouth. <laughs> um, so the phrase that struck me from your talk, among many others, was false binaries. And I remember um, Daniel Kahn Gilmore saying, we hear all the time that governments say and law enforcement say they're going dark. Yeah. And at the time he said, they're not going dark. They have so much data that if they can't see, it's because they're staring at the sun. And yet that narrative persists that, as you said, 
the introduction of confidential communication is seen as something that law means law enforcement are losing access to data. I can't believe that net-net they are losing data. Do you have any thoughts about how we can counter that narrative? Well, I thank you for telling that story because DKG is amazing and um, that's just a wonderful freaking way of putting it. So notice I'm not actually swearing. I'm, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's okay, we can um, beat those. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think it's almost like that is an illustration that what we're facing is not a misunderstanding of the facts. We're facing a will to power. And those in power love to constitute, shore up, increase their power by increasing information asymmetries. So I don't know that we're ever going to win that argument. You know, it was, it was 2000. Um, the uh, NSA started Bull Run per Snowden. And like 2001, the FBI started with their going dark narrative, right? So this was, you know, this is, they weren't going dark. We, we kind of know that now, right? But nonetheless, that was a, you know, pervasive sort of public a rhetorical turn that, uh, you know, is very convenient to those who want to sort of, you know, show up, shore up their power and access. And I do, you know, there's, there's great evidence that there's actually, you know, the issue is that we're adding to the haystack without adding techniques to find the needles. So more and more data is actually detracting from, you know, if we're going to assume a, a benevolent purpose by a law enforcement, although, you know, I think we can have different views on law enforcement's engagement here, right? Um, so I, you know, we're not, I, I guess what I'm saying, we're not going to win simply by force of rhetoric because I don't think we're having a good faith argument. Thank you so much. Hi, um, uh, my name is Cameron Morris. I'm a PhD student at the University of Connecticut. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the strengths and weaknesses of the NIST privacy framework as an approach uh, to privacy conversations, at least with U.S. companies. Um, I am not familiar enough with the details of that framework to offer an informed answer on the stage right now. Um, but I think, you know, NIST was created to enable standardization of, for commercial purposes to enable sort of, you know, international commercial transactions. Its legacy is sort of fits within, squarely within that remit. So I think, you know, NIST is very good at, you know, examining, defining, determining standardized approaches, um, but they're not a radical organization. And I think, again, what we'll need to do is just look at, you know, what are they actually proposing? And again, NIST is never going to standardize the democratic power to decide how privacy is deployed, right? They, you know, define standards, but they don't address that kind of core problem I was getting at in the talk, so yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, hi, my name is Thorsten uh, Kraus from University of Würzburg. I can't hear you very well. Better? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Thorsten Kraus from University of Würzburg, and first of all, thank you for the talk. It was nice to hear a little bit of history here. And my question uh, yeah, concerns a little bit about the future. So if uh, we think we want more privacy, and especially for those big companies, do you think that uh, this can come from requests from the customers? Or do you think that politi uh, politicians has to be involved here so that they have to make a law to force the companies to yeah, add more privacy to their products? Or can this be done by like the requests from a lot of uh, customers? What is your opinion about that? Yeah, good question. Um, well, the problem is their customers are cloud, you know, people who get sign large cloud contracts, you know, the DOD or major enterprises and advertisers. So, like, we're not the customers, we're the subjects is one of the issues we're really facing with how the incentives work for a lot of these business models. Um, and I think my answer to that, however, is sort of it, we need all of it. I, you know, my... I think Matthias was very, very generous and sort of gentle with presenting kind of my history at Google, but I didn't simply leave because I wanted to do research in academia. I left because I was looking around at these practices, looking particularly at Google moving towards signing contracts with the Department of Defense to build drone targeting software using a lot of this data and AI, and I was like, hell no. So I did a lot of labor organizing, and as a tech worker inside these companies, I had authority from the work that I'd done and a lot of people who simultaneously understood 
how these systems work and that a lot of the claims being made and a lot of the premises were unsafe and, and untrue. So in that position, I, I was like, what levers do we have? Well, let's go back to history and, you know, we also have a stake in this company, so we're going to start speaking out. So I think, you know, I am, I'm heartened, particularly within companies where corporate secrecy hides so many of the decisions, to see an increase in whistleblowing and in sort of ethical organizing by a lot of workers. I think we need movements on the outside that are also calling for that. So the customers come into play there saying, you know, we don't want facial recognition in school districts. We don't want pseudoscientific you know, privacy invading AI that's going to determine whether we're a good worker. We don't want our data stored in some, you know, unsecured SQL database that's definitely going to get popped and sold on, you know, to every other security service somewhere. Like we, you know, we don't want any of this. And I think that pressure has to be strong enough that it is more painful for politicians to ignore it than it is to act on it. Because politicians don't act, you know, there's hundreds of millions of dollars lobbying them right now. They, they have a lot of incentives not to do anything, so there needs to be sort of a lever that creates enough incentives that they have to do anything. So it's, it, you know, it's everything all at once. Okay, thank you for that answer. Yeah. Last quick question, please. Um, thank you so much, Meredith, for your talk. Uh, my name is Ayami Day from Stevens Institute in New Jersey. Um, I just wanted to, to get like your brain on, what do you think on data like storage and retention periods? for like big tech companies or even like companies in general as towards like prioritizing privacy. So what do you think like an ideal data retention or data storage um, period should be like? Well, this is maybe the most radical answer I'm gonna give because I think none. We shouldn't be collecting this data. That's Signal's position. The only safe way to deal with data, the only safe way to handle these systems is never to have it, never to collect it, never to know it. And if we could make that ethos common sense, I think we'd live in a much better world. So um, just to buttress on that, do you think like, um, how can the companies now like maybe improve on like their systems or do you think like those two like be room for like improvement on like the current technology or like the current systems, um, given the fact that they can't like store or like even like retain data, do you think it's possible to do that without like retaining or, or holding on to users' data? I mean, there are there is the worst practices and there are the best practices. There's you know reproducible builds with you know like in, encrypted hard. There's all sorts of things we can do for harm reduction, but I think it, you know it would we'd have to get into specifics around which company is storing which data. And then I'm, you know, from the perspective of this talk, again, I think there is a fundamental issue with the companies having, you know, being able to make the decision to add or strip encryption to, you know, protect or not protect. Like, that's the kernel that I am interested in changing, not in sort of entreating and imploring and, you know, like trying to optimize harm reduction that these companies can deploy without changing that fundamental power asymmetry. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.